All right, guys, Killers of the Flower Moon. Bam! The newest film by Martin Scorsese. This will be our spoiler review of the movie. Sorry so much for the delay. The good news though is that it's because I've been doing a lot of voice work, uh, specifically on an audiobook. Check out shorts for that for the tour of the voice booth here on our channel. All right, let's get to the review. As always, smash that like button, hit subscribe for more videos like this on GM TV, man. Gangster movies and television, mob news, mob history, all things organized crime. If it is organized, if it is crime. We're gonna talk about it. All right, so let's do it. So I saw this movie twice. Bam! The first time I made the mistake, I haven't had weekends off recently, so I've forgotten that the real world is a terrible place on the weekends to not go to the movies on the weekends. Uh, anyway, point is I used to go to the movies more on the weekday and totally was absent-minded about it being Friday afternoon, got caught in a ton of traffic. Point is I missed the reason I go into that is because I missed the whole opening of the movie, probably the first five to 10 minutes of Flower Moon the first time I went. So really I had to go twice to give you a sufficient review. Once again, my initial reaction short is up here on the YouTube channel. I said right then and there, I was like, this is up there with Goodfellas. Goodfellas is my personal favorite Scorsese movie. I don't necessarily think it's his best objectively. I think I said on that short, in fact, that Taxi Driver, let's all just agree that Taxi Driver is probably his best movie. If we just hang that up and then say, what is your favorite? Goodfellas is still definitely gonna be the top. I still don't think, as I said before, oh, it's as good. I don't know if it's as good on a second watch. And we're gonna get into the details in a minute. I think a lot of that is the opening, which once again, I did miss the first time, but now that I have seen it, just kind of like, eh. Also, some of his movies since Goodfellas have felt like an old man, like trying to be cool. This not so much, thank God. There was a little bit of that, but The Departed especially, even parts of The Irishman. You don't have it. It's just a lot of really good songs and old classic rock you know, paired with shots that are good and like it's good camera work and stuff. It's just, again, it just feels like an old man trying to be cool, whereas this does not. So this doesn't move as fast for me on the rewatch. I said in my initial reaction that the three and a half hours, I was blown away that the three and a half hours didn't feel three and a half. They still don't feel three and a half, but it feels like a long two and a half, <laughs> which is still a compliment, but um, I still needed to get up more and walk around. I think the point is, the first time you see it, I didn't want to get up to go to the bathroom. I truly didn't. I That's how engrossed I was. But this time, now that I have seen it, I was very happy to just kind of get up and wander around a little bit. I wasn't on the edge of my seat as I was uh, the first time. But I will say, it is still so pleasing to just sit there in a theater and watch this thing. Like, it is gorgeous beyond belief. Martin Scorsese, this is him at the top of his game, really. Again, I'm not saying it's above Goodfellas or above but it, it, it's still him at the top of his game. So let's get into it a little deeper. All right, so starting off with length. Again, it still moves incredibly well for what it is. And a lot, meaning three and a half hours, <laughs> a lot of that is due to the naturalistic. Scorsese is just so good at directing actors and picking scripts and working on scripts. And the script was good to begin with, where the movie just moves. Like Goodfellas, you don't even realize it's two and a half hours and it's just boom, boom, boom. You almost don't realize you're watching it. I've been reading Bukowski. I recently discovered Charles Bukowski in one of his books, The Post Office. It's just like you don't even realize you're reading it and you're, the, the book is done. It kind of felt like that. Again, it didn't quite feel like that on the rewatch, but still. The naturalistic dialogue and the way it's edited, I think the movie really impressively moves. I still think it could have been brought down to three hours. Like I think three, this movie would have moved even better. But here's where the length pays off. The last act especially is so satisfying. Like this buildup of, I guess I'll get into the first part first and then we'll talk about the payoff. So here's where the length pays off leading up to the third act, the investigation part. The length pays off because it allows you to see the story from DiCaprio's point of view and how this long con of murdering an entire family of native women would otherwise feel rushed, I think, and not believable. Like, if this was a two hour movie, there's no way you would buy, all right, we know what's going on here, we see it, but it just would have felt almost like a horror movie, right? You would just have De Niro guiding DiCaprio and DiCaprio would have felt maybe too easily manipulated. Whereas with this three and a half hour thing, it's like, oh, I'm back to see my uncle. You know, you're seeing it from DiCaprio's point of view and this epic Western point of view and this gorgeous landscape. And he gets sucked into the native culture and he 
truly does fall in love with a woman, which makes it even more tragic. So you have all that combined with this building story of mass murder. And I just don't know if even under three hours, even two and a half, I think would have been too short for a story like this. So as you can probably tell throughout this review so far, and even in my initial reaction, I was really rolling my eyes going into this movie. And in the last video too, uh, I talked about how three and a half hours, I was just kind of like, why does it have to be? I don't think three and a half hours worked for The Irishman. Uh, it did not have to be nearly, and that was on Netflix. You know, this is a, a theatrical experience. So, but I, I still don't, once again, anything less than three hours, my main point, would have been way too short, I think, for a story of this long con. Now, you have this long con, he's doing this horrible thing. Again, this is spoilers, so you've seen it. Between the medicine and then the whole just grand plan of De Niro plotting this whole thing with DiCaprio under his thumb and Byron and this whole crew of kind of like weird gangster slash, it's like a combination of, what would you call it? Arranged marriage meets Western, I don't know. It's just sick what they do to this family. Seeing this long con then pay off after all this time and we get to know DiCaprio, we do feel for him to an extent, but in very much a Breaking Bad type of way, DiCaprio just turns into this monster and we see the manipulative power of De Niro's character. And then, you know, we, we know his true colors right off the bat, but to see, again, DiCaprio devolve under his thumb and then get this investigation, right? So you have all of that way we talked about before and how the length pays that off. Then to have the third act of this thing, Jesse Plemons arrives to the house, knocks on the door, they have that conversation. It And before we continue, actually, real quick, the humor is another thing I really should have mentioned in the beginning. This is not a comedy by any means, but along with the naturalistic dialogue, goes hand in hand with that, is the humor of the movie. It's just funny. Like, a lot of this movie is funny, and it's fascinating that you have this horribly tragic story taking place you know, with the backdrop of, you know, the darkest sides of colonization in the American West, coupled with just funny moments, because that's how life is, it's just funny. And I think it works perfectly well with, once again, having it from DiCaprio's point of view, and we're gonna get deeper into how the movie goes from his point of view in a second, but sticking with length, once again, it's like, to get this payoff of seeing him devolve into a monster and then see, again, Jesse Plemons shows up. The FBI, what's the FBI? <laughs> and then you have more investigation and see other people get taken in and then you see the interrogation and all, you're just like, yes, fucking take these pieces of shit down. It just feels so satisfying to watch that. And that is what movies should do. I mean, that's storytelling at its best is to just feel that satisfaction, but to, specifically to feel a slower satisfaction, I think is interesting. Uh, to, like a, the true feeling of justice because we've lived through this horrible thing. What's interesting to me is that the few review headlines that I did catch, so with reviews, if you're new to the channel, I avoid other people's reviews before I ever do my own. But you know, you catch stuff, Instagram, whatever. And a lot of what I'm seeing with the few things that I did catch was was, you know, too much from the POV of the white man. And like, I get that. I totally get what you're saying. If it's a movie about <laughs> Indian women being systematically killed by white people, but that doesn't mean that the story isn't told for them. Meaning like, it still really demonizes <laughs> the bad people in this who are the white man. Like, I think it actually makes the DiCaprio and De Niro characters that much more despicable because you see all the inner workings of their evil plan and how, you know, it's like, that's like saying like a Darth, a movie from Darth Vader's point of view doesn't speak to the plight of the oppressed rebels. Like, yes, it does. If it's done right, if they actually, which they should make a Darth Vader movie that's good, it would actually speak to the plight of the rebels better because you'd see how horrible this human being is. Um, and it should make Vader look even worse if it's done right. I actually enjoyed the first time I saw the movie because I missed the opening. Once again, I missed the opening the first time I saw it. I kind of prefer that viewing because I think the better opening is DiCaprio showing up on the Osage land on the train. So it's like, you know, the industrial world brings him into the native world. And then you're seeing it from his point of view, seeing him slowly get manipulated and turned once again, devolving into this monster. I think that that would have been better than, and you know, he also 
the first conversation he has with De Niro, it's like, oh, I'm greedy. You know, so we know he has a weakness with women. You know he's greedy. Perfect fucking setup. So you could just build from that. And I think you would get enough exposition with his learning about the Osage and his voiceover. He's reading that book. You have the pictures. And I loved how you'd be introduced to native characters or other characters. But you get these still photography shots. That's your exposition into the story. The whole opening of it before that, to me, I don't think he really needed that silent film. Like, it just was too much exposition, too much. In my opinion, it was slightly lazy insofar as it was such a direct way. I'm not trying to call Scorsese lazy, but you know, just like if you do criticize, if you do have a criticism of this movie, if I have a criticism of this movie, it's like if you did voiceover, but you didn't do it well. Like there's a common criticism of voiceover where it's just the simple, easier way to get exposition. I think that kind of silent film and just some of that stuff in the beginning, I also was unclear that TP scene. Anyway, back to this DiCaprio stuff. You know, I think the POV of the greedy colonizer wandering onto Osage land, discovering it through his eyes. Like, I just think that's a, it demonizes the bad guys who once again happen to be the white man in this a lot more. So I don't know if, if your position is that it makes, like if your position is that it should be from more from the native point of view, I see that. I would also th assume then that your point is should be more for the benefit of the native people. I think this does benefit the native people more because you're seeing it from this monster's point of view. Also with three and a half hours, you do see a lot of the native perspective. Again, you're getting all these still 1920s, uh, still photography 1920s snapshots of the family, of the background, with DiCaprio reading it, you're still getting it. It's just, again, through the bad guy's point of view, and I don't see how that takes away from the story. I truly don't. I'm really trying to look at it objectively. I see the point of this movie, but I think it also avoids the trappings of the more obvious messaging that has been going on with a lot of film, and just what you would more expect like I saw another headline, it was like predictable, question mark. Like that was the thumbnail on the YouTube video as a review for this. Again, I didn't watch the review, that's just the thumbnail, but still it's like predictable. Well, yeah, it's, pre it's called Killers of the Flower Moon. But to me, what was not predictable was seeing it once again from the monster's point of view. I thought that was just a fascinating, almost weird, very unexpected way to do this whole thing. Performance, Jesse Plemons. <laughs> I know DiCaprio and De Niro and Gladstone are the main characters, but I had, like, this was the first thing that came to my mind. Amazing as always. You know, Todd from Breaking Bad, the guy from Fargo. Okay then, okay then. <laughs> Perfect casting for an early FBI, Texas, former Texas Ranger, early FBI agent in the 1920s. Ah, God, I mean, perfect tone setting. And I do find it interesting, you know, I did overhear a criticism, like heard someone say like, all the actors that you're looking for only come in in the last act of the movie. I'm like, yeah, but the last act is almost an entire feature film. <laughs> you're talking an hour 15, an hour and a half. Then you get John Lithgow as an investigator. Then you get, or as you know, one of the lawyers. Then another lawyer is Brendan Fraser. Then your other big actor that comes in once again is Jesse Plemons, who comes in even earlier. So I, I don't think that's a good criticism either. I think all of those actors, yeah, they're not in huge parts, but it's a Scorsese movie. First of all, it's super long, so they are in a decent amount. And second of all, I think it's kind of cool that you just have giant famous actors almost in like cameo roles. And I think it worked a lot better than, you know, Oppenheimer did that recently. In that, it was almost distracting because it was just like, why is Remy Malik here? I don't quite understand what's going on. Whereas it was very clear. It's like Brendan Fraser is playing an intense, old school lawyer. <laughs> John Lithgow is crushing this performance as well. It was pretty clear what, what they were doing. All right, so we'll finish up performance and then I'll get to some things I didn't like because I just want to make sure I get those out of the way. Uh, overall, again, I did love it, but we will get to that. Uh, DiCaprio, man. I mean, just, you know, I said with Jesse Plemons, as always, this guy, as always, a little more obvious, but still. He, so this is what I kept thinking last time, last night when I watched it. Here's my review of DiCaprio's performance of Killers of the Flower Moon. You're only as good as your last envelope. <laughs> you know, speaking of gangster movies, speaking of GMTV here, you know, Silvio Dante said it perfectly. He's like, you're only as good as your last envelope to Pauly Walnuts. This guy delivers performances like he's still 30 years old, 25 years old. It's like, this guy's going on 50 and he is still putting in the work and is as hungry as he has ever been. You could just tell like he, and the amazing thing is he plays it big. Like he overacts without overacting. 
<laughs> he plays these huge performances. His characters get so mad. We saw it in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You know, he's just going nuts. That trailer scene, that iconic, what's become an iconic freak out scene in the trailer. Now we're getting it with this performance here when he gets super pissed off. You know, for the most part, this guy, he doesn't play it too big, but the parts where he does, it's just, I feel like any other actor, point is it's not easy to play it big without overacting. And this just goes right into the naturalism of the whole movie. Any scene is completely convincing. I don't remember one part of this movie. Sorry, I do. Rewind. There's only a few parts of this movie that to me weren't convincing acting wise. And that's across the board. Also, he does this underbite thing. Like it's cool to see DiCaprio not in the pretty boy role. Like he doesn't play a super attractive guy. She even makes a comment. He's got his nice blue eyes. He's still very charming, very, you know an attractive person but he does this underbite thing and it's just like you forget it's DiCaprio at some of the parts and it's just so damn convincing his accent work you know 20s southern Oklahoma accent all on point the Osage language him and De Niro De Niro has been doing this going back to Godfather 2 when he like went to Sicily I'm pretty sure I know he did learn the Sicilian dialect he just went above and beyond to make it convincing for those scenes where he was a uh, young Vito Corleone he did the same thing like these guys are speaking and they go in and out and I also love they didn't do subtitles I love when movies do this not just with other languages I love when Tarantino started doing this with Inglorious Bastards and then other languages he did it even in Django and then on top top of that in this it's going in and out of languages without even the subtitle so all of a sudden they'll just start speaking Osage and you don't know what they're saying but specifically this scene when he gets into the argument with Lily Gladstone and he just starts like kind of hitting the table because he's so mad about she doesn't want the other guys administering the drugs and he just gains his composure while freaking out and he calms himself down and takes a deep breath and that man that was good but just him going in and out of the language so many props so many props and once again not even knowing what they're saying but kind of knowing what they're saying i think was such a fascinating way to do the language thing because that's how it feels in real life obviously there's not subtitles so that is how it feels to kind of go in and out of languages lily gladstone man i knew lily gladstone from hoke d her character of hoke d on reservation dog i haven't seen her in anything else but she was so good in this movie again naturalism and then her playing off of DiCaprio was also I mean them being a literal couple but even if they weren't I mean their chemistry of him being you know the wild man her being the straight man if you will the straight woman her native calmness his greedy white guy big personality was just him truly falling in love but then still closely following De Niro's lead of taking her out along with the rest of the family it was just so sick yet so amazing to watch and then her performance so good and finally De Niro like still on point it's good to see this too after the Irishman CG face you know it was hard to tell if that if he still did have it because it, it's hard to do any kind of facial acting when your face is covered in a bunch of CG and that movie wasn't great anyway De Niro is an old man and he plays a great old man Go figure. All right, so camera work slash visuals. Theatrical experience at its best. Once again, just sitting in the theater watching this thing is so pleasing. It is meant for the theater. They did that opening thing where like they did with the uh, Top Gun movies where Scorsese introduces it himself. You see behind the scenes work on it, how all these sets are real. I mean, it's just an incredible experience. The fact that it's an epic Western too, I think I talked in the beginning how that totally works for the length. Just by genre, epic Westerns are long. They're long ass movies. Good, the bad and the ugly. These movies are huge films. Um, this had an almost Lawrence of Arabia type thing. Although I did wish if I do have any criticism, there was a little more of that. I think we could have gotten a little more like bigger epic Western shots. Although in the beginning, man, that opening shot of all the cattle, you're introducing us to the Osage land when DiCaprio is like, whose land is this? And he's like, my land. Um, that was all so good shot freaking beautifully. I just would have wanted a little more of that. But beside that, dude, other camera work tracking shot after the explosion they're passing the kids around the house they don't know what's going on because you're trying to feel it from like the pov of someone running around that house wondering what the hell is going on the insurance fire oh my god people are going to study the insurance fire to the end of time in film class when de niro sets the farm on fire to get the insurance money and you are seeing even inside you know this is the part when it gets really dark between DiCaprio and Lily Gladstone when she's like you're next and you know because he keeps injecting her with death 
along with her insulin and he takes it and they're kind of like dying together almost. But the windows, that felt like an old timey movie thing where Scorsese was just like, you know what? I'm gonna make this feel like an old movie. This does not look realistic at all, but it just had this blurred out, again, old timey background window movie thing with the glowing of the fire. And it just was absolutely gorgeous. The silhouettes of the men working on the fire. Oh my God. You had the heat waves where it's all blurry and then the fire and then these guys just with the pickaxes and the shovels. So gorgeous and whatever, whoever did the music in this was so on point. Speaking of that, you know, throughout you had just the dum, 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 this thumping, this native meets Western thumping that was just so damn good of the tension of DiCaprio and De Niro just systematically taking out this family. So sick. A very sinister sound to it. All right, so I will say I highly recommend Killers of the Flower Moon, especially for the theater. Especially, especially, especially for the theater. But you will need a bathroom break, and I would say see it twice if you can to get the full experience. Again, you're gonna need to go to the bathroom. I think you should go to the bathroom and not feel guilty about that. This should have an intermission, let's be real, but it's the, the modern world. Um, also, the length alone warrants a second viewing since there's so much story and just so many incredible visuals to take in. So just see it twice. Again, at the end of the day, it's just very pleasing to sit there and watch this movie in the theaters. It's absolutely gorgeous. Again, beautifully written, beautifully acted. Scorsese still at the top of his game, man. And again, the last thing I'll say, I was a little worried even from a directorial point of view, is this guy turning into like an old man trying to be cool? And if The Irishman was the last project, there was a lot of that in there. It's like, is he going to CG? What's he doing? And man, he couldn't have done a bigger 180 for this movie. No CG, it seems like. He goes to the West as his first ever Western. Talk about ambition for a dude who's 80. Just incredible. Yeah, man, I highly recommend Killers of the Flower Moon. All right, so once again, that is our spoiler review of Killers of the Flower Moon. More to come on this movie. Uh, we have reactions to other people's reviews. Again, I deliberately avoid other people's reviews when I do my own. So now that I am going to jump into other reviews, I can't wait <laughs> to get in my car right now and just listen to a bunch of reviews. Uh, so I will react to those. We also have a discussion with my co-host on my other YouTube channel, Above and Batman Beyond. Subscribe to that too. YouTube.com slash Above and Batman Beyond. Uh, but we do have my co-host from there, Eli Benson, my best friend and co-host over there. He's going to talk to us about, he's watched a bunch of the gangster movies, including a bunch of Scorsese stuff. So he'll be a great guest to have on. He's very smart. And once again, one of my good friends. So Eli's going to come out. We're going to talk about Killers of the Flower Moon. And like I said before, check out our YouTube shorts right here on the channel uh, for my tour of the voice booth. Been doing a lot of voice work, have an audio book coming up. Very excited to get that recorded. All right, so next vid, we're going to switch gears to another mob directing icon and news on his new movie, and that is Francis Ford Coppola's upcoming Megalopolis. Some Megalopolis news dropped recently, so who better to cover next?